Thanks so much for having us. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. So many faces. Yeah, I hope you're all staying safe and healthy uh, and taking care. And thanks so much for being accommodating since this happened to fall on this on this particular time. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, uh, I think uh, to start with, well, I want to jump into questions as soon as possible. Um, but also, I brought, um, I have, since this is mostly about the movie art book, um, I have all of my sketchbooks that the movie art book sort of has in it. So if you want to see like the, the actual type of book that it was, it's just one of these squatros. Um, but a lot of my concepts were in here. Uh, and then I have another too. And I just use, these are all just like ink and Copics, uh, stylo markers. Um, some of the earliest ones before we kind of figured out a lot of her cartoonier elements. I've got this one too. It's just sort of covered in stickers, but um, let's see. This has actually, oh, this ended, this ended up being the cover of the book, but this has this in here. You know, they never, with Copics, it's like they never look quite as good as they do on the page that you draw them on. So I wish that there were, were a way to replicate it exactly. But yeah, these were all the sketchbooks from the formative movie times. Um, they look beautiful. How yeah, big is that? Really, hmm? How big? Yeah. These are at 9 by 12, I think, both of them which is a nice size. And I used to hate sketchbooks because I'd get really antsy about um, doing a drawing I didn't like, but I, I've tried to push through that for, especially for the movie, we just had so much we had to get done and I needed to stay organized, so. Um, but it's totally fine, if, I think, anyone who doesn't like sketchbooks. Um, I used to just draw on loose leaf paper and, and stick it in a binder and that helped me because it, instead of, I, I could throw a lot away, which I always liked to do, but I kept most of this movie stuff. Um, anyway, uh, and then the, the movie art book also has a ton of cats concepts in it. Cat, you usually do stuff. I I see you do draw on anything you have your hands on, like post its or the margins of pages. Like, do you do sketch? You do sketchbooks too, right? I have sketchbooks, but I have the same problem where, like, especially if you carry them around with you, they 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 become a portfolio. Everyone's like, oh my god, let me see your sketchbook. You're like, oh, that's not that's not what this is about. I actually just have a ream of paper at home, and I just draw, and then I have like a huge stack of drawings. And I'll sit down and I'll go through them and kind of cull the ones that are just like, ah, there's blanket, nothing good about this one. And then, oh, maybe I'll save this one for later. This was a good idea. And then I have boxes. Basically, when I die, <laughs> someone will open the door to my apartment and just paper will fly out. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. Quantity is, is good. I think if the, qu if the quantity is there, the quality comes along yeah. along with it in the in the torrent it'll, it's bound to be in there so for every 100 drawings there's half a drawing that's almost okay yeah <laughs> yeah that's how it feels um yeah I, I got i got to see the the, the uh, art book finally and it's, it's amazing it's got so much great artwork work in it and it's uh, I, didn't, I didn't realize like you know there's like the japan side of it and everything and just seeing that that was really interesting as well Right, right. Uh, Takafumi Hori's keys are in there. That's, that's, I'm really glad we got to showcase that. And we have some of his work also in the Art and Origins book. And then there's an art book that's coming out soon, um, End of an Era, which also has a bunch of uh, Hori-san's work in it, which uh, is, is great because every frame is brilliant. So being able to lay them all out and, and not only see how good each drawing is, but how they work together. I mean, it's, it's really exciting to to finally be able to share the process stuff from that. Um, so should we dive into the questions? Yeah, let's dive into some questions. I'm sorry if my audio is a little bit. Um, so let's start with some story questions. Um, for, so the first question, for songs written for Steven Universe, are they written often rooted in personal experience or imagination? Right. Well. Usually when we have a song for the show, it, it starts as a, the function that it needs to serve in the story. So if the characters are, I, I like an arc to happen in the song. So we sort of, we'll have the outline and then we'll say, well, the song will go here. And 
the characters are feeling this way in the beginning and then by the end of it, they're feeling another way. So it sort of has something it has to do. But then in order for it to, to feel authentic, I usually have to kind of mine down and figure out why we wanted to write about that story in the first place and what I'm thinking about and how that's relating to what's going on with me. And once I can tap into that, uh, I can kind of join the, the function of the song with the meaning of the song and that, that allows me to kind of just keep trial and erroring it until it feels right. Is, is there a person in real life who each character is based after? Um, a lot of them, yeah. A lot of them are amalgamations of multiple people. Um, Connie, for example, is named um, after the friend of mine who lent me Utena in high school, but also named after Kat's friend. So she's sort of a, a combination of multiple people. And then I think there's a lot of, uh, well, Kat is like the Connie expert. So Kat, I, I think there's a lot of, <laughs> of, of you and people you know in Connie, if you want to speak to that. Oh, uh, nah, that's okay. <laughs> it's weird because you don't want to get into specifics of like who it was and at what time. But yeah, uh, right. Connie Warren was the, was the part that I added because I had a friend in elementary school who was a huge reader. Uh, she really loved A Wrinkle in Time, which I think, is that the first book that Connie was reading on the beach? Is that her Catcher in the Rye? Right. Oh my gosh, she has a lot of different books. Well, she has Left Handed Darkness in the, in the second intro. I think in the first it might be. Um, I was thinking about uh, Bubble Buddies when she's reading. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, the prop, I remember the props <laughs> because they're so pretty. Because um, the books are really yeah, good. Then, some of them, some of the characters are, are real one-to-ones, like obviously Steven is my brother. Um, and then I, I think, you know, but we all kind of put ourselves into Steven and then Amethyst and Pearl and Garnet. Um, it, depending on who's storyboarding them, they end up a little more like wh whoever's boarding and whoever the, the people who's board, who are boarding it love. Um, uh, Kiki and Jenny are uh, relatives of Ian's that are real people that we sort of turned into cartoons. So, um, and then we appear sort of the, the crew appears in the background often, but I think you know, we, we kind of put ourselves into a lot of the characters, like Peridot's based on sort of a, a composite of several people that I know, um, but particularly my college roommate who I would argue with a lot. Um, so things like that, everyone, everyone kind of, and I, and I think it's, it's nice to kind of pull from a lot of, of different people that you know, so that, so that it's not too one-to-one, -one, but also so that there's room kind of you put yourself in but also a little of what inspires you about someone and um always that way it's it's always coming from a real place but it doesn't have to be a direct one-to-one -one. I always check with Stephen too to make sure that he was cool with all the various iterations of Stephen because he really became much more of his own character and, and less like my actual brother and, and also very inspired by Zach everyone became very inspired by their cast yeah. member so awesome um, let's see, how did you get the idea of creating a story revolving around gems? Oh, that was, um, so around the time that I was working on the pilot, I was also working on the Flame Princess episodes of Adventure Time. And I was really enjoying drawing the, the gems in Flame Princess, the one on her chest and her forehead. And it reminded me of um, uh, Oak, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, like I always really liked the sort of uh, gem visuals and languages and in, in those characters and their outfits. So it was really just an aesthetic thing that I was already having fun with at the time. And then after that, I started learning a lot more about gem meanings and healing properties and all of that it was really fun and interesting. I didn't know much about that when I started. Um, so that's where it came from. What, what, uh, what year was that roughly? 2012. I think maybe even, I, it must've been 2012. It might've been 2011 even when I was working on Adventure Time and just starting the pilot. Um, let's see, uh, how much of a story did you have in mind at first? Mm -mm -mm. Um, when we were first, first starting out, I tried to keep it pretty loose so that when the team came together, we could, we could really work on it together. 
Um, so I think I, I started with kind of themes and goals more than the actual one-to-one -one plot. And that's really what kept the structure for me was to just always know what, what my goal was and what my point was as, uh, and then which specifics I was really attached to and to let the, the rest be really flexible. Um, Kat, do you remember, uh, I'm trying to remember what our early documents looked like because they were like beats of, we, we had like a lot of the history um, so that we would be able to progress the story understanding like where it was coming from and, and we had a, uh, um, things that we were moving towards and we actually had things that sparked really big arguments in the room like um, the, there was this concept of perfect Steven while we were working on season one there was going to be this this large pink mode of Steven which which we actually didn't we have drawings that are from like 2013 but we didn't introduce this until future and that was this really controversial thing within the crew uh, because we all decided collectively that Steven Steven is perfect like there isn't a perfect version of Steven or a, or a stronger or more powerful or a better version of Steven because that already just is Steven and that argument really formed the whole trajectory through change your mind um, when we sort of introduced the idea that if you separate a certain part of him out he ceases to be himself um, Maybe and we were able to drawing, human Steven was just goo <laughs> like when they yeah. to say, he was like a puddle of human and then like a regular bodied gem. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty disturbing. We we reined that in. There were a lot of things that where the plan was more disturbing and we pulled we pulled it in a little, <laughs> little bit. But that was actually planned. The separating Steven into two pieces was was planned for episode 10. That was going to be part of Giant Woman where he like learns to fuse and then when he unfuses that's sort of what happens to him. And then we just decided to really push that out to episode 162. Um, let's see this one. How did the design of Mega Pearl come about? And there's a comment that says she looks like Utena and anti fusion. Yeah, I had an early sketch that was a little more Sailor Moon looking, which I, um, I remember Joe liked it. I was really unsatisfied with it. I was into um, it, but <laughs> it's me, so obviously. Um, yeah, and I think we. I, I wanted to pull it a little, a little more towards uh, Tenna because that, that the show to me is more Tenna related than Sailor Moon related. Uh, and then we did a ton of exploratory, like so many exploratory drawings. Yeah, our character designer, Becky Dreidstad, did like a ton of finished looking model drawings and we just kept editing it. I was really obsessed with getting the Anthe hair right. It's such a hard thing to do. She kind of had like a little boy Fauntleroy <laughs> look at times. It was definitely a hard one to get, but it came out well. Um, how is Jasper doing after <laughs> SUF? And why was the shirt changed from the movie for future? Was St Steven's shirt? Um, yeah. shirt easy, he's just bigger and he's wearing. <laughs> The adult shirt now. Yeah, I think they're they're wondering why did even just keep the same design from the movie. Well, I I wanted the movie to be its own thing, so the movie shirt was special. Um, for the for the the black shirt is was established because it's Greg's shirt and Stephen's clothes. The pink shirt and the black shirt are both shirts that were part of Greg's tour. Um, when he first met Rose, so we always wanted him to eventually end up with Greg's black shirt because he just had, had gotten, um, you know, cause he'd grown up and he could fit it now. The other ones were like the little extra small shirts, the, the pink ones. Um, so, but for the movie, we wanted it to be its own thing. And so we, we arrived at the blue, I think cause I just, I just wanted all those colors to be part of his design, just pink and blue uh, together are a big part of Steven's design, so I really wanted to highlight that before um, before future and have it feel like its own thing. Um, did you always plan on having Rose become increasingly more complicated? Or she basically became the real villain of the movie? Um, well, yeah, I guess for us, we, we always under, we started out understanding her and who she was. Um, 
And I think if, if you do go back and you watch all the episodes with her, you can, you can really see the ways that she struggles with empathy, uh, with relating to people, um, with just sort of, um, with, with being able to respect other people. That, as Rose and as Pink, I mean, you can, you can see her really trying to not be that person, but it, but it comes through, especially in We Need to Talk, uh, in Greg the Babysitter, you know, her, her impulse control is pretty poor. <laughs> um, she, she doesn't really think about when another person, you know, how what she's doing might put another person in danger. But all, she struggles with all of these things. So uh, I suppose as we were laying it out, we we wanted it to be sort of increasingly clear and we wanted all of that to be clearer in hindsight um and it was i, I thought it was really fun to to just sort of slowly expand on her character and and make her earlier behavior make more sense when you when you understand more about her um we really i think really until future you don't get everything uh, you never quite get everything about her, but you get a lot more information even after the movie uh, based on how, how, how she treated uh, her original Pearl. So all of that, all of that is sort of already a document that we were working with from the beginning and then just slowly, slowly expanding on a little bit at a time. I, I don't know, Kat, do you remember any uh, early, early Rose conversations? Oh. I would say, I don't think we ever came at it from the angle of thinking that she was the true villain of the show or anything like that. I think she's just as complicated as anyone else. It's also sort of like a, being a kid to an adult where, you know, your parents, when you're a child, seem infallible. I mean, Stephen had a more complicated relationship because you didn't really know her, but through other people, she seemed infallible. And over time, he grows up and realizes she's just as messy as anybody else. Although she has some pretty <laughs> not so great stuff <laughs> that she's done. But I still, like, we never really write anybody as, like, a, a true villain character, except I guess maybe. <laughs> yeah, I can understand that. Um, I can totally understand and appreciate that interpretation. I think that interpretation can apply to, also to many of the characters on the show. Um, when I think of Pink and Rose, I, I always sort of thought of her as a cautionary tale about what what can happen when you have really dangerously low self-esteem um, and also the environment that can create that situation um, and the toxicity that can can emerge from that environment um, so I go into this a little bit also in the upcoming <laughs> the upcoming art book I, I wrote about it a little bit more so Um, what drove you to make this three universe movie set in the future? Um, oh my gosh. Well, there are many, <laughs> there are many reasons. Actually, there's a reason I can't talk about yet. Um, but I really wanted it to feel like, like really different, like its own thing. Um, and I wanted it as, sort of as a musical. <laughs> this is a big part of it because it was going to be a musical, I wanted Zach to be able to use his full vocal range. And so I wanted him to be able to do a voice much closer to his actual voice. Uh, that was a huge part of that decision. Sorry. <laughs> all, all the new book. Uh, when is the new book coming out? Uh, oh, I believe it's coming out in the fall. Um, oh, some uh, thank you to the um, thank you to Carlina about the Zim forward. I was really I was really nervous about that. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so a couple more story questions to get through. <laughs> uh, okay. What is something you would have liked to have added to the movie? I think we got this question a lot. You, to have, oh, to have added to the movie? Yeah. Let's see. So, um, well, the movie, so the, mo the earlier versions of the movie were in a lot of ways uh, simpler because the story, we really built the story around friendship and love. 
Um, and I ended up butting heads with the network a lot over this because they really wanted this story to be about how the, the a threat of the world ticking time bomb, um, the sort of more conventional action format. Um, so there were parts of the parts of the movie story that that I found really exciting and interesting, especially about um, there, there was more about the contrast between the friendship that Connie and Stephen have and the um, and the relationship that Spinell starts to believe that she has with Stephen or when she becomes really sort of unhealthily attached to him. Um, and I was really interested in exploring that area, but that was not something that we were able to expand on because we ended up having to shift our focus more to the um, injector threatening the town. Um, so I do miss that, that part of it. Um, Stephen's any memory was, uh, he was just avoiding conflict. This whole thing is he just didn't want to confront the diamonds. He didn't want to confront Spinell. She was actually, she would like oscillate back and forth between best friend and villain and he'd have to continuously <laughs> poof her. Yes, that was rough. I, I don't <laughs> mind yeah, that. That one, <laughs> that was good to lose, I think. Yeah, he was actually, Stephen was a lot, was a bit, um, the changes to Stephen, we actually moved a lot of that into future. <laughs> the, <laughs> the story about Stephen's conflict aversion and how he's actually, you know, creating a really difficult scenario for himself by avoiding bringing up something difficult to the people he loves. That used to be a huge part of the movie and then that all migrated into future. So um, I guess, I, I think it's good because ultimately we were able to explore a lot of different facets of that in future instead of just one with a character you've only just met. So um, I think at the, end, at the end of the day, it was a good thing, but that's where a lot of those concepts originated and, and before they slid into the, into the epilogue. What are some current sources of inspiration for you? Oh man, um, the, I'm really fascinated right now with the show um, I May Destroy You which uh, we, we've, we've been watching. Um, I think it's just incredible. Uh, and that's obviously not a show for kids, but I also think in a lot of ways, it's the first show I've seen in a very long time that really honestly feels like it's for adults and is dealing with something that, it, dealing with many things that are, that are for adults. And I think it's just covering ground that I have not seen any show cover. And a lot of the conversations that I wanted to be able to incorporate into Steven Universe about consent in a way that in a way that children would be able to understand. I, I'm realizing watching the show, I've never actually seen that confronted in a way that adults can understand or anyone can understand. And she's just really laying everything out. I, I just find it, um, it's just blowing my hair back. It's just amazing. So, and I really appreciate it. I just think, thank goodness every time uh, there's a new angle of it that she's able to talk about. Um, what, what? I also just watched a penguin, a penguin's memories. Have you, Kat, have you ever oh, seen a penguin's memories? Oh, is that the Memor Colorado movie or whatever? Yeah, it's a, it's just, it's a peng these penguins and one of them has post-traumatic stress from uh, being in war and it's really, the, but the characters are so cute. It's really good. <laughs> better um, or worse than the Whisker movie? I think I liked it better, although I liked the whisker away. I, I, there was some stuff that was pretty, pretty questionable, I think, about not knowing the, the cat that you're interacting with uh, is, a, is a human that's interested in you romantically. But uh, <laughs> um, in, term, in terms of, of questionable uh, narratives about consent, I think that that sort of is in there. Cat, cat, what are you into right now? Uh, I actually just renewed my library card, and I've been going to the library a bunch. <laughs> Oh, awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm reading Octavia Butler, trying to expand my my reading to be more diverse, since I realize it's mostly a lot of white people. Um, but yeah, I'm just trying to pull out a little, it's, it's, okay, I said I'm trying to pull out of media, but that's not entirely true. I'm kind of going back to things that I watched when I was younger and seeing how I still, if I feel the same or if I feel differently, it's kind of a litmus test of like who I am versus who I was. My taste is pretty similar. <laughs> Uh, but then I'm also just trying to get out, like just be outside, away from people, obviously, mask on. Uh, uh, I try to stop looking at social media around nine o'clock so I can actually sleep. 
uh, it's, I'm just sort of like in a reconnect with myself mode, I guess. Yeah. What were you guys' uh, favorite songs from an animated musical and why? Any animated musical? The animated musical. Um, I always liked the villain songs. I liked Poor Unfortunate Soul. Great answer. Villain <laughs> <laughs> songs are always the most interesting. Uh huh. Yeah, Hellfire. That one's pretty. That one's pretty nuts. Really. Um, gosh. Uh, I was really um, frustrated by the update of Be Prepared in the um, CG Lion King. What did they do? It's, al it's almost a spoken word number. It's, <laughs> it's, oh man, Toxic Love, that is a good song. All right, everyone in the chat already, <laughs> their fingers already on this pulse. Um, they're, they're always so good. I always love, love those because they get to be in minor. Um, <laughs> yeah, but then I think I'm also really inspired by uh, music, like, like stage show musicals and live action musicals. Um, so I, I pull a lot of inspiration from that. Crazy World from Victor Victoria is a huge inspiration. Um, everything from Fiddler on the Roof, which I've watched a million times growing up. A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, which I watched a lot. Um, music Man all the time. So all, all of that I'm, I'm really fond of. This is a pretty interesting question. How should we interact with artists on social media? As passionate as the fandom is, sometimes it's still hard to find the right word or moment to express our support without pressurizing you, especially when they are sharing personal stories or having a hard time. Right. Um, <laughs> this is, I, so, I have sort of a long uh, arc of, of feeling about this. Um, I think when, when I was first starting the show, um, and, and I'm, I'm pretty open about my own sort of struggles with mental health and, and really low self-esteem, uh, a lot of people would say r really amazing, positive things to me, but the, the, a lot of the negative things would be very personal. And I was really in a position to only absorb those really, really negative comments. And I found that a lot of times the most amazing positive comments, it's like, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe them because of the state of mind I was in. Um, and then partway through the show, especially when the Steven fandom was, uh, there was just a lot of, of really extreme cyberbullying in the Steven fandom. I spoke to a bullying expert through Cartoon Network, um, a, a psychologist that they work with. And he started to talk to me about, uh, about how bullying actually works. And I, and I realized at that time, even in my, in my late twenties, I really was not aware um, of the dynamics of bullying. And, and the main thing I wanted to know was sort of if, if someone's being bullied, how do I, like Steven in the show, in many cases, Steven is sort of be in, in a position where he's a victim of bullying. I was like, how does a, how does a victim of bullying respond? Like, how, like how, do you, how do you win that situation? What do you do? And what this person told me was that um, the person, the victim of bullying can't actually push back to the bully because that's the response that the bully wants, uh, which is, I think, also why when you see a lot of explosive um, situations on the internet, when, some, when someone is being harassed and then they respond and they say, hey, I'm a person and this is really, this is actually really hurting me and, and what you're saying isn't true, it doesn't make it stop because that's actually exactly the response that the people who, want, who hope that they're doing harm want because they find out that it, they're succeeding in doing, in doing harm. So, the, so this person was saying that the only way that it can work is if the, is if the general peer group, like in the case of a classroom, if, this, if the other students or a teacher uh, see this happening and they go, hey, I, that's, that's not true, that's really unfair, please don't, you shouldn't treat someone like this. That's actually how you make it stop, the, the, the peer response, not the victim's response, but the peer response. And all of a sudden, I started to view the situation online really differently which is that instead of only absorbing the negative things that were being said to me, I started to really notice how many people were coming out of the woodwork to say, hey, what you're saying isn't true. So when someone would say like, Steven Universe goes off model because Rebecca is so lazy and incompetent, 
that would come up often. There would be people that would jump in and they would say, actually, uh, Steven Universe is designed to go off model because that's something that Rebecca really cares about. And what I suddenly understood that was, was that was that was the actual um, response to bullying that diffuses the bullying situation. And my gratitude to those fans just expanded hugely. And sometimes it wouldn't, it, sometimes it would be about the show. Sometimes it would be really personal things like saying, you know, like when I came out, people saying like, oh, she, she's with a man, so she's not really bisexual. Like the fact that someone would come in and say, that's not how that works. Actually, that's a really biphobic thing to say. Like, I have so much gratitude to those fans because that is actually the way that you quell a bullying situation. So in terms of, of interacting online, I'm, I'm now sort of in a position where when people say kind things to me, I really deeply appreciate it. And anything that any, if anyone says that, that this meant something to me, in a position to really internalize it and depreciate it. And I also really appreciate it when, in the case where someone is saying something that's untrue about me personally or untrue about the show and the nature of the show, the fans that jump in and say, actually, I watched the show and that's not what the show actually says. Actually, I know how the show was made and that's not how the show was actually made. Actually, this, this was obviously done on purpose and it's not an accident because this team is incompetent. My gratitude to those fans is huge. And, and that is like, the in in terms of the that's those are the people that are coming in to to save me from a position where i'm being victimized so I, my gratitude to them is huge so, so thank you to everyone who's done this uh and if you're in a position where people are are attacking you or saying personal things about you or negative things about you um i hope that also you'll start to really notice when when members of your peer group come to bat for you, because that's, those aren't the outliers. That's the actual thing happening. The, the outliers are the, are the untrue things being said about you. And the reality is that people don't buy into that and they, and they don't agree with that and they know what's actually going on. Oh, that's great, thank you. Um, all right, moving on. <laughs> This person asks, I am a new animation student beginning my classes at CalArts this fall, but I feel scared and pressure to create my own original work on student films. When you're experiencing art blocks, anxieties to produce your own original ideas and stories, how do you overcome your own fears and discover the confidence of your own unique voice? Let's see, do, Kat, you wanna? Do you wanna <laughs> Sorry, this to me. <laughs> um, I feel like, there's, I mean, there's so many parts to that, right? I think a lot of people, a lot of artists, especially young artists are worried about their style, like how, how they're different from other people. I think that just comes naturally. Like the more you create work, the more you are gonna show through it. The fact that you're drawing is already, it's your hand, you're, you're already in there. Uh, and then also uh, this, uh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Rebecca. No, I think that's so true. Um, oh, sorry, you're, break, you're breaking up. What was the last thing you said, Kat? Wait, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're back. I just lost you for a second. Hold on, I think my thing is messed up. <laughs> can, if you can, take it and let me see what's going on with my computer. Okay, um, yeah, let's see. I think... Um, it's really, really natural to be sort of worried when you're creating something. If, uh, and, and I think the way that I think of um, starting a project or making something, I really think of it like communicating. Um, so at, at, a person, at a certain point, I started to think about doing comics and doing animation, a little like sitting across the table from someone you're having a conversation with. And in, a, in approaching a project, I, I began to think about it in terms of trying to explain why I care about something to someone else. And that helped things become clearer to me. Because when you're saying, when you're speaking, when you're saying something, you don't always say, you know, there's an opportunity there to, to mess up or say something clumsy. That's natural. Uh, and it's natural to be nervous about that. But I think that if you understand what it is you care about and why you want to convey that to another person, then it becomes easier to start that dialogue. And what I've noticed in terms of making work is that like a conversation, if you say something you think the other person wants to hear, they're gonna 
be able to tell pretty quickly. And if you say something that only you care about and you don't care if they ultimately care about it too, that, uh, that is, that's also usually not something that, that really in, engages someone. And I think that's not the only way to make art. You could make art that you, and you just don't care if anybody else becomes interested or cares, that's totally fine. Or you could make something just because you think that other people really want it and you want to, you want to do that for them. But I find that I'm most interested in something when it feels like a really honest expression. So I would say, whatever you're nervous about, just, just push through and be honest. And uh, the, I think the worst thing, the worst case scenario is that if it's a little clumsy, then you learn something about yourself and you refine your ideas. And that's, that's really powerful and that's really helpful. It'll help you grow as an artist and a person. Yeah, the most important thing is just to do it. I think if you're worried about having a creative spark you'll be sitting there forever. Like there's an aspect where you just have to move your hand to make, especially if you're in school for it. Like you don't want to fail your classes. You have to force your hand to make it. And then once it's made, you can go back and adjust it. But if you're just forever staring at that blank page or that blank screen, you will get nowhere. You just have to put in the work, even if it's scary. Absolutely. Um, so the next one, how do you pick color palettes for your characters? Oh, well, this is very specific for Steven Universe because we actually, the way that, well, at least when it comes to gems, um, the gems are, the, the various colors that the gems are relate to who created them. So if you have a, you know, a gem that's extremely blue, they may be coming only from blue. Uh, purple gems have a little pink and a little blue in their parents. Uh, and we, we actually have a, a chart to sort of map out where everybody falls, but you can tell a lot about what a gem is like just, just by their color palette. Um, so the gems that have some pink in them tend to be uh, more passionate and more funny, um, maybe a little irresponsible. Uh, gems that are blue tend to be very introspective if they have some blue in them. Green gems tend to have a mix of sort of uh, um, proactiveness, but also intellectualism. Um, so they're good for these kind of uh, technological tasks, uh, um, for being pilots, that's really good. So they're sort of um, active, active intellectuals and um, the pal paler gems get more and more judgmental. So mm -hmm. that, was our, that was our strategy. But then some, I think, you know, for like, for human characters, often it's just, uh, we have these, we have like loose things like, like Connie tends to wear teal and stuff, but not always. We, I like to keep it a little more realistic where, you know, people have different clothes. Okay, good. Um, so this is, uh, for when both, okay, this is for both of you guys. When you start coming up with ideas for a new project, what steps do you take to stay focused? I feel like the beginning of a project, it's not a lot of focus necessarily. You're like you're pulling in from so many different things and you're trying to codify it. So I think the more specific you get over time, the more focused it becomes. Like, what do you think, Rebecca? That's interesting. Yeah, maybe there's almost, it, it depends what approach you want to take. I think sometimes there's almost a magic eye approach where you could just try and dissolve your focus so completely that something new comes into focus. I'm really bad at taking that approach though. I, I tend to come up with a, a point I want to make or a, or a thing I want to do or a thing I want to learn and I just charge at it um, as much as possible. Um, but I, I also kind of like the push and pull where it's like, like I, if I feel like I'm getting too in my own head on an idea to really back up and be like, you know, what is this? Is this what I'm trying to say? Is this design getting this point across? You know, am I, am I getting too in the weeds here on this concept? Um, for like, like I think of it like a forest trees um, kind of macro micro thing that I'll, that I'll do a lot, especially with Steven's stories. Like if I'm getting really fixated on a detail, I'll be like, okay, okay, hold on. But like, what's the forest? What's the forest? And then once I see the forest again, I'll be like, okay, but I really want like a sycamore, you know, in episode 45 or whatever. I think it's also important to, hmm, how do I put this? 
sorry, I keep losing my thought. I feel like I'm so focused on what you're saying that, oh, focus. <laughs> I think it's important to ask why you're losing focus. I think when you're excited about an idea and it's especially when it's early on, you can just go at it. But the more you get in your own way, I think you can lose focus. You're like, what, what's holding me back? I think, uh, especially if like, let's say you're doing like a web comic and you've got insanely deep lore and the more you write it, the less you actually make it. I think if you simplify and ask yourself, what's holding, are you afraid you're not gonna be able to draw it well? Do you think it's so long you'll never finish it? Look at what's happening and attack it that way. Right, yeah, I remember there was like an art school thing where, where I'd meet people who, who are like, this is the prequel to the prequel to my saga but they never made the saga. You yeah, know? exactly. On the other hand, it's like whatever makes you like excited to, to do work. But I think, you know, again, part of it being a conversation is, you know, how do you let people in on what is exciting you about this, especially I mean, in your There's family. definitely no harm in having some long, deep story that you never make. But if you want to make something, you have to figure out what it is that's stopping you from making it. Yeah, yeah. I think also, I, I think it's good, you you know, if you do find yourself losing focus on on what it is you care about, maybe the thing is what is just not as compelling as you thought it was to begin with. <laughs> yeah, yes. Like maybe maybe what you, the reason you want to do it is a different reason, and 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 when you when you take that step back, you're like, oh, I'm actually writing about this. Like, no wonder I couldn't stay engaged with this other thing. So soul searching is a really important part of the whole process. All right, I think we're gonna take one. Uh, I have one more question before. Uh, we go ahead and look at the uh, the chat questions. Mm -hmm. uh, so this last one is kind of like a two parter. It's um, it's advice for creating creating work. So it's do you have any advice for people who want to create and work in cartooning but don't have the art school experience? And what advice slash tip would you give to someone who wants to create a show? Um, don't let not going to art school hold you back. Anybody at any time can make, all you have to do is do it. Draw, paint, write, whatever your creative drive is, follow it. School is just, it costs a lot. <laughs> Nobody guarantees you work after. Like it's definitely great for meeting people. I mean, I met Rebecca at school, but I also know you online. So who knows, maybe I would have met you anyway. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, you, sometimes you meet teachers who can help you out. It's, it's a nice experience, but it's not a required experience. And it's not something that we required of anybody we hired. Right. Um, I think there are, there are plenty of cases where someone is doing independent comics or has uh, work online that exhibits storytelling skills that may, they may not have gone to school, but it's, if you can write and draw, and if you can tell a compelling story through drawings, that's a skill that very few people have. I think the other thing is, if you just know the basics of perspective and layout, like if you can draw a character standing on the ground and moving through a room, um, a, a lot of these skills, it, it's not... Uh -oh. if I could, uh, some books that really helped me. Oh, Hold did on. I break up? Yeah, you broke up. Okay. Um, I learned a lot from a book called Perspective for Comic Book Artists by David Chelsea. Um, those skills are really critical as a board artist. You, you can't just draw characters floating. They have to be walking around and existing in physical space. Um, I learned a lot about figure drawing from figure drawing for all it's worth and also just from going to life drawing classes. And while I was in high school, I would drive to a local college on the weekends and take figure drawing there. So I did, I, before I was in college, I was able to do life drawing and that's very critical. So you can definitely do that on the street, in the park, if you mm -hmm. are in a city that has a subway, like you can just observe people in life. You don't need to go to a school if it's something you can't afford or just don't have the time to do it. Absolutely. But I, I do think that uh, the greatest advantage of going to a school is that it, it just gives you time and a place where all you're doing is, is working and where you're meeting other people who are passionate about what you're passionate about. But if you can, there, there are many ways to make that happen for yourself. If you can just give yourself time and space to draw and also get in contact with people who are passionate about what you're passionate about. So, um, and then the advice for if you wanna run a show, um, I think the, the biggest, most critical thing is like, please work on someone else's show because boarding and, and doing revisions and all the work I did on Adventure Time, I never could have put together a, a team 
a production team if I hadn't seen what a production team looks like and understood, you know, how a storyboard driven show functions. Um, I see a lot of people who really want to skip the step of working on someone else's project and just dive right into their own, uh, which is also great. I, you know, I come from independent comics. Nothing's stopping anyone from making an original story right now in that format. But if you're working in television animation, it's, I think it's really helpful and healthy for the team you end up working with to just understand that pipeline. Um, for, for example, when I was starting the show, they tried to convince me to get rid of the entire direction X sheets department. But because I'd studied animation uh, and because I'd been on a production, I, I knew that you need exposure sheets in order to, for the movement to happen. So I said, no, I, we can't cut this department. Everyone will be guessing how the timing is supposed to work. We don't have anybody laying it out. Um, but I, I was young and if I hadn't worked in television animation, I wouldn't have, I, they could have cut that department and then the thing would have looked completely bizarre. So well, we just would have had way more retakes that we'd have to do in order to make it look right. Yeah. And I saw that happen to other shows. They got rid of that whole department and then they would get, they would get the work back and they'd go, why is this so wrong? And, and so one, somebody asked me once, like, I, I don't understand, like ha half the scenes are wrong. I, and I was like, you know, you're not giving them, any, they're guessing. I'm surprised they're, that they would guess right half the time. That's a miracle. <laughs> it's, you know, you have to tell people how, how these things, how you want them to be. So yes, understanding the pipeline, understanding what goes into it is so, so critical. Even the really dry stuff, uh, the really dry production stuff, the labeling stuff, uh, how, to, how to label a storyboard. All, the more you know about that stuff, the, the better you'll be at managing a team. And so I strongly recommend working on someone else's show and, and just being really curious about every aspect of the pipeline so that when you when you make your own this is something i talk about with ian a lot too so much of how a show looks in the end is because of how you set up the pipeline um where you decide that care should go uh um where you where you put your resources because in television animation you don't get a lot of resources so you really have to decide what you're prioritizing that affects the final look completely so and a lot of people are are frustrated and sad about that because it doesn't look like a feature, but when you really understand that, you can start to strategize to make what you care about be at the forefront of the thing. Also, sorry if you don't know what X sheets are. Uh, we didn't come prepared with a screen to share for that, so feel free to look it up. Yeah, but yeah, check out an exposure sheet. Basically, at any like, say there's a line of dialogue, you know, it says like looking. It'll be spelled out lo looking, like all down every frame and then which mouth goes with each frame, and then where the, you know, if you're raising your hand, your hand's here, and then it's here on exactly which frame. You have to know, that's where the animation happens. If we were doing it all in-house, then maybe we wouldn't have to, <laughs> to, to spell it out in that way, but because we're explaining this to another team of animators, we have to be very clear. Very educational. Um, so yeah, with that, I think we have a little bit of time to Feel free to look through the chat and uh, pick out some questions that you'd like to answer. There's a yeah, lot. Sure. <laughs> so do we start at the top or do we just? I think, um, well, I, we can just look at if people would ask, if they asked previously, if you wouldn't mind asking again, I would love to do a horror, a horror project. <laughs> Thank you. That would be great. Um, I love horror games. I wish I could make a horror game. That's a secret dream of mine. Um, let's see. Oh my it's gosh. We're not in the same room. I guess I'll just let you do it. Um, yeah, do you want to, do you want to pick one? We could go back and forth. Uh, I guess whoever sees one first, since they're kind of laid into other things. Oh, I like, I like this. The, um, do gems still have the option to use limb enhancers during era three if they want to? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that if, if gems want, if, Red gems want to use green limb enhancers, they can, they can go for it. Anyone who wanted to use them and couldn't use them before, if they want to be twice as tall, if they're regular height, use them. Anybody can use them if they want to. That's what Era 3 is all about. Era 3, baby. Yeah. Uh, were, any, uh, were there any scrapped gem ideas? Oh my gosh. We um, have that in the book. Yes, Morganite. I, yeah, I designed, <laughs> we had a Morganite. I really like that design. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's well. It'll be in the, <laughs> in the next art book. Um, a very tiny concept for 
for Morganite. Yeah, I wish we had done that. Um, but we did what we could. Let's see. Um, oh, I like this, uh, the how do, um, how do we handle anxiety for pitches, interviews, present? I found um, for pitches, pitches, interviews, presenting your work for the first time, uh, I totally, I totally get this. I totally relate to this. I'm really shy. It, it was really hard for me to pitch. I always used to feel like it was extortion. Like the characters were tied and gagged. And if I didn't just do it, then I would, they wouldn't get to live, you know, um, <laughs> like the, like the idea is like I had to, even though I, even though I really didn't want to do these like presentations, it, I had to, or I would never get to see the ideas realized. So, so it was, it was rough. And I remember I, I found an old email cat to you cause you were working on a regular show before I moved out. And that was my question in my email to you was, was how do you do pitches? Cause it sounds awful. It sounds like the most, did I actually have advice or did I just say, I don't know. Um, you said it was really hard. <laughs> I could probably find it. I remember when I started regular shows, like I have to do this multiple times for one episode. There's one episode where I wrote a song that got cut anyway, but I had to sing it and the whole day I was just pouring sweat like, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to sing in front of these, these people. I Really, it's just, for me, it was just doing it over and over and over again. I mean, no matter what, you still get butterflies, but the more you do it, the more it just kind of becomes a thing that you do. Yeah, it's really part of the job. Um, and and what I found is, you know, the, the more compelling you can be, the more energy you put behind selling it, uh, the more likely it is it'll get made. So I used to rehearse in the bathroom for like an hour. <laughs> yeah, I used, to, I used to go up on the roof. Yeah, you, you, uh, I, singing was really hard. And I remember singing the song from Nidosphere up on the roof with Ian and, and like, he'd be, he'd be like, okay, again, but just a little louder this time. Because the first time, like, no, you can't hear me because I was basically whispering. Um, it's really... Uh, and it's, it's, it really also depends on the person. Like Penn, when Penn would pitch, he, he, his enthusiasm was extremely muted. <laughs> that was sort of, sometimes he would forget his glasses and he wouldn't be able to read the, the words. And he'd kind of like, like squint and pause. And it, it had its own energy. I saw that there was Sam Valai, who boarded for Adventure Time, once did a whole pitch holding a Subway sandwich in his hand because he just hadn't eaten his lunch yet. So you oh. can... You can you can pitch in a variety of ways. You don't have to do voices, but you can if you want to. Um, I think at the end of the day, if you make it clear what you care about, then the conversation that haps, happens after is very different because because you'll have really you're you're selling. You got to really sell it, and the harder you sell it, the more likely it is people will buy it. So just good good luck, and you and you can do it. You can push through. I still really struggle with anxiety. Um, it never quite goes away, uh, and that's. Okay, I think I, I've developed a relationship with it where when it happens, I'm sort of like, hi, anxiety, thanks for looking out for me. I'm gonna be able, I'm gonna be okay. <laughs> like, uh, and I, I experienced a do or die moment. <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of, I experienced a lot of shame overs like after I've pitched, just picking apart everything I said. And that's also just something that um, I've come to recognize. Like, this is just, ha this just happens, it's worth it to, um, to try and say something. Uh, let's see, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, there's 70 <laughs> messages, hold on. Uh, would you be able to go over the gems in the walls slash statues from the episode familiar? To go go over them? I guess talk about why there are gems in walls. <laughs> um, oh yeah, well, all of that was inspired by Busby Berkeley, um, how, and, and things like in um, Diamonds Are Our Girl's Best Friend, there's like these lamps that are made of human women which is just supposed to be I guess aesthetically pleasing but seems just horrific when you really think about like I don't know what what is that uh, I remember a long time ago I was reading a fashion magazine and there was a quote from a designer who said you know a woman is like a beautiful piece of furniture I was like that's horrific <laughs> what, a, what an absolutely disgusting thing to say so all of the stuff in Homeworld is really based on that concept the idea that it would be appealing you know, just aesthetically appealing to subjugate people, aesthetically appealing to objectify people in just in every form. The, the bridge has a face and, mm -hmm. um, you know, people are, people are immob immobilized just to be there for aesthetic purposes. That was something I was thinking about a lot. But now they're free. Walls are just walking around. <laughs> Era three, baby. Yeah, I really wanted to get, <laughs> I 
<laughs> Let's get that wall in there. <laughs> know that they're, it's very subtle, but you can actually see the holes where the, where the walls used to be um, at, the, at the end of Homeworld Bound when Steven's running. There's some concave <laughs> of walls where they came out of. Um, gems and walls, hold on. Um, Um, de so developing story arcs in the show, um, uh, that was really, this is also in the upcoming art book. I would make a lot of charts that, that kind of show the arc from the beginning to end, just really, really pared down. And it's also super flexible. So I would, it would be like, none of this is tied down, but this is what I'm thinking. Um, and so we would kind of look at broad arcs and then we would look at individual episodes and then we'd say with each episode, is this contributing to the arc? Where are the characters at the beginning of the episode? Where do they end up at the end? How much closer does that get us to this point? Sometimes we'd realize a whole episode could lift and shift somewhere else. Uh, Prickly Pear, for example, in uh, Future used to come almost at the very end and we lifted it up and we put it earlier um, instead. So, uh, so instead of it being the culmination of Steven's frustration with himself, it was actually sort of earlier evidence of, of it brewing. So things like, things like that, that's how we would map things out. Um, I did see Cats. I did see the 2019 movie Cats. <laughs> Very excited to see it. Um, I don't, I really wish they, I don't know if it's, if it's my place to say, I wish they were just in, in costumes. I like practical effects a lot. I'm a big practical effects fan. So seeing like collars shifting around because they're not physically there, I just, I think it'd be awesome if they were in a costume. I thought Judy Dench did an amazing job. <laughs> I really believed her, her, her cat acting. Um, okay, let's see. Um, I'm not, uh, so, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, this is, so how, how did we balance creating a fully realized story arc with the looming issue of knowing or not knowing? Oh, that's what I'm looking at. That's the, that's the realist is. Um, I read the so, questions so everybody knows. This is part of the, this is the, the thing about the whole show is we had to keep planning um, up to these things that could, could be a finale, but also aren't necessary, necessarily a finale. And we were sort of- the opposite Ocean Gem. Yes, it could have been Ocean Gem. It could have been Jailbreak. Um, and then after that, we got a big 52 episode pickup. So we were running for a while and we, we really didn't know what was happening after that. And then we were in this strange limbo where, I, where nobody knew what was happening after that, um, in part because of this big merger that was happening at the studio. Um, and then also in part because people were becoming aware of what we were doing with the show and we were starting to get this feedback from um, different international iterations of Cartoon Network that were, that were threatening to pull the show if it became, if I spoke out about the fact that the characters were LGBTQ. So um, at, at that point, it was, it was implied that the show was ending it seemed pretty definite and I was like asking for more episodes and I was campaigning to do the movie. Um, I, I think a big part of, of the, st the stress of doing the whole show was that it, it felt like the plug was going to be pulled at any moment through almost the entire eight years of doing it. Even with the movie, um, deep into boarding the movie, we weren't even necessarily greenlit. Um, so I think we would always try to make something that would do double duty. If it has to end here, then we want it to, to be satisfying in every way that it can be. But then if we get more, then we'll be able to really fully realize the story. And, and it also meant that we would have to strategize, um, especially with something like the movie in future, because there are ideas in future that actually um, were going to go earlier, but had to be completely reinterpreted because Steven was older. So I think, I think, of, uh, Running a television show as opposed to making a feature feels, I think, a, a little more like surfing, where these this, like tumultuous waves are happening, and and it's it's almost you can plan, but it's really just an act of kind of navigating the the shifting of everything that's happening under you. Um, and I think that also I, I love animated TV series and I, I like TV shows, and a lot of times that's what you're seeing when you look at them is people navigating that shifting landscape. And so I don't dislike that that's a big part of what Steven Universe is, is, is like planning for these possible endings and um, 
jumping forward into a story when we get an opportunity to make it that the stories that we didn't know we could tell or finally have a place where they can live. Um, when, when people kind of ask, oh, is the show not quite what you wanted it to be? I mean, to me, that, that when you're making a TV show, that's a big part of making a TV show is that you're, you're a little bit at the whim of, uh, of, the, of the elements in that way. So I think it, it, I, I, in a lot of ways, I like the ways that it forced us to be creative. And I think of that as a big part of the project. Um, Jasper's okay. Don't worry. Uh, real quick. Just uh, want to give everyone the heads up. Uh, I think we got time for about three or four more questions. Um, okay. Let's see. Yeah, Jasper's okay. I, one thing I wanted to show, uh, not, not only does she, does she come to say farewell to Stephen, but I really wanted to show that she's returning, um, willing to return to little homeschool and really set foot in there. Um, and I, I mean, I have my theories about what Jasper's up to now, but I think that um, she's more, more willing to engage with people now, which is something that I wanted to, to hint at. Um, let's see. Uh, thanks to the person who likes the demo finale song. I did that with Gallant, who's so great. Um, I don't know if I can revisit Pug Davis. It was from such a long time ago, but I'm really glad that there's um, a new color edition out, and I love how the color came out. Um, so I hope people will check it out. Oh, uh, uh Oh, are we done done? I'm still looking at questions. You, you wanna, can, can we go to like 12.10? Do we have a cap here? Oh wow, it's already 12. There's no cap, uh, but I was, for your guys this time, it's really up to you guys, honestly. But I was to say like three, four more questions. Okay, Kat, what did you see? Uh, what was the decision behind the switch of the diamonds powers? So in the future, how their powers have evolved, what was the decision behind that? Right, right. Um, I always, you know, I, I had written this in my little private notes a lot. Um, I always thought that a big part of, of what Rose's epiphany would have been would be about how sort of sort of putting putting gems in these very specific boxes is really limiting what they're capable of in terms of power. Um, like like her being capable of healing would be something that she would have, I think, discovered that she didn't necessarily have a use for when she was being destructive or when she was being repressed. Um, and I, I was always interested in kind of implying the potential that every gem has to really step way outside of the limits that are being imposed on them. And that's something that was true for, for Peridot and her frame of mind. She had powers that she didn't know she was capable of because it wasn't necessarily part of the person that she was supposed to be. So I wanted that to be true for the diamonds also. And I wanted to think of a flip of, um, there's a concept I, I kept returning to on the show called an antiodromia, which is a Carl Jung thing. It's like any extreme will inevitably produce the opposite of that extreme. Um, so since the, since the diamonds have these extremely destructive, extremely um, repressive powers, there has to be some sort of other side to that coin and I wanted to explore what that would be. So um, with blue being able to tap into things in an emotional way, the idea of exploring how that could Oh, no. to comfort and happiness. Wait, hold on, you cut off that blue. Misery. Um, is this better? Am I back? Yeah, you're back. Um, the sort of the flip side to the misery that blue is able to impose. And I think that this is also true. You know, if, if you are in, in a state um, where, where you are trying to inflict your, your misery on other people and, and radiating that out in a very deliberate way, like she does, that'll affect the people around you. But on the, on the contrary, if you are taking the time to really stabilize yourself uh, and to create um, a happiness within yourself, that's, it's possible to radiate that out on other people too. So I wanted to exhibit, exhibit that with blue. And then yellow um, you know, is someone whose powers were all related to, to destructive actions. Um, to, uh, she was always kind of the physical side when blue was the emotional side. So instead of physically damaging things, I wanted her to be in a position where she could physically repair things. Um, and then white, uh, her ability to override other people's identities, um, which had so much to do with her, her fragile sense of self and her need to impose that on everyone because she thinks everyone is her, because um, she really kind of has, has no identity of her own. 
the idea of being able to let that go and let let other people um, in instead was really interesting to me. I was also really inspired by these these little rainbow light bulbs that I got at the six two six night market in a drink. Um, oh, ice cubes. <laughs> Yeah, and then flash different colors. It was like a long time where I was like, I don't know, I, I just really like this and I want to incorporate this imagery somehow. Um, so the idea of her flashing like one of those light bulbs, I was kind of trying to find a, a reason to do that. Um, so that was part of it too. But yeah, any, I, I feel like it's fun to explore the way that an extreme could produce an, the opposite of that extreme. And I think ultimately, if you're able to achieve a, a balance, I mean, I, what White is doing is also, it's kind of disturbing <laughs> also. I mean, uh, all, what all of the, their overcorrection is like a little much in every case, although honestly they, they should be helping people, um, obviously should be helping people and should be stepping aside and letting other people's voices be amplified instead. Um, but, you know, hopefully in a world where they hadn't created that wild imbalance then that overcorrection wouldn't have been needed. So all of that was what I was thinking about for them. All right, how about we end on this one? What parts of the Steven Universe creating community do you both love? Editing, drawing, cosplaying, etc. cetera. Um, um, I love all of the creating. Please keep creating and use Steven Universe as a jumping off point. At some point, you're not gonna wanna draw these characters anymore, or write stories about them or dress up as them, but take it to the next place. What's the next thing? Don't be mean to each other. <laughs> Don't criticize each other so hard. Creating is difficult. It's so, it's so appreciated. I love seeing everything that people make. Yeah, I love, I love cosplay. I used to cosplay. I used to live in Maryland, so I would go to Otakon. Um, I went as Luffy once. I drew the, the scar, I had the hat, I did the vest and everything. And it wasn't out here yet. So people would be like, who are you supposed to be? And I'd be like, oh, I'm Luffy, it's the number one show in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> like people didn't know, this was a long time ago. Um, but also, I think, you know, I struggle because I have glasses, so I never quite look um, like anyone. I wanted to think about also, while putting the show together, was trying to make a lot of um, cosplay options for as many people as possible, because that was something that I that I really, really cared about. I'm also really sorry there's so many barefoot characters. I know it's really hard to do. Um, I, I, that's why I wanted to give Lapis some sandals <laughs> and, and some pants. Um, and yeah, I just, I really, I really, really love, love cosplay and the cosplay community. And I'm so grateful to everyone who has worked so hard on, I know it's so difficult to, and, and such an undertaking to make those costumes. I really appreciate it. 